All right, we are live. Well, welcome everybody, um, wherever you are in the world and whatever time it is for you. Um, we were just sitting here having a little pre-panel chat. We are all over the world here. Um, so it's it's morning for some and evening for others, but regardless, we are so excited to be here with you. Um, for those of you who um, are new to YA Thriller Con, uh, the amazing, uh, indubitable, maybe two people or more, Madeline Dyer. Um, is, this is her brainchild, child of her heart. Um, and this is the second year uh, that Thriller Con is happening. And it is a wonderful combo of panels like this one with these amazing people that I feel so lucky to be here with today and readings and master classes for all things thriller. So. Um, this particular panel is genre blend, so dystopian, apocalyptic, and fantasy thrillers. Um, I don't know if they're all three at once, maybe two at once, I don't know. Um, but what we're going to do first is just go around and um, just introduce ourselves, and maybe if each panelist just wants to say um, their name and where in the world they are and um, what, they, what, what they're writing. Kit, do you want to start? Uh oh, Sorry. you're still muted. There you go. I'm okay. muted. Sorry. Hi, so I'm Kit Mallory. I'm in Bath, UK. Um, I am the author of a queer YA dystopian duology. Uh, the first book is Blackout, and the second book is Sparks. Um, and it's set in a near future totalitarian UK where fuel and power are limited, and the north and south are divided by a wall. Um, and a thief, a hacker, and a former ballet dancer turned vigilante um, end up very reluctantly on the run together. That's me. I love that. Uh, Tanzei, do you want to go next? I am Tendai Huchu, uh, a writer as, as T.O. Huchu, and I think Kit has stolen my plot points and my ideas because <laughs> I also have uh, The Library of the Dead, um, which is set in Scotland in a slightly dystopian, futuristic um, UK in which sort of like, you know, the kingdom isn't as united as it was before. Uh, and it's the story of Ropa, a young girl who speaks to ghosts for a living. She basically picks up messages and delivers them until one day she's asked to find out uh, who is stealing kids. Um, stealing kids, that sounds awful. <laughs> Who's kidnapping kids? Um, and this sort of like drives her into the occult and and the darker side of magic in, in Edinburgh, published before two other sort of like mainstream novels, The Hairdress of Harare and The Maestro, The Magistrate and The Mathematician. But this particular novel that we're talking about, The Library of the Dead, is sort of like a blending of fantasy, a bit of thriller, a bit of mystery and a slight sprinkling of horror. Yeah. Ooh, love it, love it. Laura, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Laura Pohl. I'm from Brazil and I'm the author of The Last Eight Duology, which is the last eight over here and the first seven over here. And my upcoming book is, I, oh my God, okay. The Grimrose <laughs> Girls. And The Grimrose Girls is about, it's a fantasy thriller that's about four friends who discover their kind of, their fate is tied to a fairy tale curse. And that if they don't stop the curse, they're gonna die like a very gruesome fairy tale death. Mm, that sounds. And like it nice. comes out, yeah, and comes out November second. <laughs> Love it, uh, Angelina. Hi, I'm Angelina Singer. I'm the author of six different books, three of which fall into this dystopian thriller category. So. I have uh, the Upper World series. We have The Sorting Room, The Fall of Zephyr, and The Rise of Onyx. And these books are about an upper world where light beings kind of sort human souls into bodies and what happens when one of them messes up and she has to go to Earth to save basically humanity and fix it before everything gets out of whack. So those are my dystopian thrillers. I also, although it's a little bit irrelevant, I have a time travel coming of age and a virtual reality sort of sequel after that. And these have strong themes and anti-bullying and just kindness because I was bullied as a kid and it was something I wanted to write about and kind of heal from that. 
And then my first is a romance sci-fi love potion, which is a cute little like Cinderella meets um, like a magic love potion where uh, this rocker kind of falls in love with this girl, but it might be because of some mysterious antibiotics she took for a sinus infection. So kind of a weird cross section between like thriller and sci-fi and everything in between. So um, thank you for having me. I'm near Boston, Massachusetts. Love it. Um, and so um, listening to all of you, I don't feel so bad now about how I tend to cross the lines with what I write. So I started off writing um, adult, I call them love stories with supernatural twists. Um, my first book was The Memory Thief and then there was The Dreamkeeper's Daughter. And then I transitioned into um, also writing YA. And so I've got this um, YA series, The Seven Sins, about this world where um, the characters live and die um, by the laws of the seven deadly sins. And um, of course, since lust is forbidden and love is a terrible thing, my two main characters fall for each other. Of course they do. Um, so yeah, so I'm really curious to listen to um, what all of you have to say about this genre blending stuff because sometimes I feel like it's a great thing and other times I feel like it puts us in a situation as authors where we don't quite know where to fit. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about how each of you have chosen to blend genres um, in what you write, whether that was a deliberate decision um, or whether it was just something that came into being on the page. Um, which, which genres have you chosen to blend and uh, how and why did that happen? Anybody can take it or I can, or I can sign you, what do you think? <laughs> Here, Angelina, you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Um, so going back to the Upper World series, which is behind me here on the poster, I was inspired by Divergent, Hunger Games, really like all of those like heavy dystopian thrillers. I loved the way they took um, like a visionary idea of like an alternate world or an alternate universe with a very different government and corrupt system and kind of used fear to motivate the characters into uh, either bucking the trends or kind of going with it. And that kind of determines like the morals of the characters, the morality of the story and how the plot moves. So um, my stories are kind of blending the thriller aspect, but also the sci-fi. And sci-fi is difficult because people think, oh, like Star Wars or oh, like something very like high sci-fi. But in my books, I always say, no, it's more like um, those thriller movies that you see. I'm trying to like take those ideas and make it my own concept while still keeping with the um, ideas that are already posed to, you know, movies and all these kind of new ideas that are popping up lately. So um, that's kind of my blend. And it's um, like you said, it is tough to market that stuff, but I find that if you just link up with both communities and kind of bring it all together, people respond really well to that. So uh, it's great. <laughs> Tenda, I know when you were talking about your book and um, you know the ghost story delivery system, but also all of the different genres that kind of found its way in, how did that happen for you when you started out to write? Did you know that you were going to blend genres or did you just have the ghosty element in mind? I think for me, it, it, it happened um, organically. And, and it's, it's something that I know a lot of my peers that I speak with, um, struggle with because most authors want to tell a good story and genre is just another thing in the author's uh, toolkit. I had this weird exper uh, experience after my first novel, The Hairdresser of R.I. came out, which was kind of marketed as lit fic, but borrowed a lot from sort of like genre chiclet. Um, and I wanted to do a second novel that was slightly different because I always think, okay, this is the story. This is what I want to do with the story. What elements do I need to have in the story in order to make it work? And I had this weird meeting with my publisher then at the time in which I was told, oh, Tendai, readers will only give you a second range. We've, we've done all right with this novel. Why don't you do a sequel or something like that? Which isn't what I wanted to do because I used those elements because I thought they would work in the story that I wanted to tell. Um, so how I do it is whenever I have a concept, I, I spend quite a lot of time just planning and thinking about what I can do in order to make it work. So the elements sort of just come in as you go. So you've got a girl who speaks to ghosts. You've got these missing kids. Um, I like stories that are sharp and fast paced, um, which works well for, for sort of like your genre thriller. 
But once you've got an element of the supernatural and magic, you're blending in a bit of fantasy in there, and, and there's a spooky house of horrors in there as well. Um, even the world that it's, it's, it's set in, and, and I know I've described it as being slightly dystopian, but it was sort of my version of a third world Edinburgh. So it's dystopian in the sense you might call New Delhi or Harare or maybe Sao Paulo dystopian. You know, they're, they're sort of like third world cities in which certain things work and other things don't, if, if that makes any sense. So th they would be on that spectrum. So yeah, I just do whatever works for the story, but obviously afterwards, and, and, and I do recognize the importance of of sort of these categories because certain readers like certain things and and it's a way of driving an audience towards that particular title so yeah i almost just work it and and afterwards i try to figure out what it is yeah i love that laura what do you think um while i was working with grimoire's girls especially i think it felt uh, mostly natural to do the blend because uh when i started working on the concept of the story it's about these girls in boarding school who um, have a best friend who dies like mysteriously and everyone thinks that it's it's a suicide but the girls aren't convinced because they knew their friend and they are sure that something else is mysterious going on. And for me, it was sort of like an investigation but as well it was dealing with grief that they feel when after their friend's death. So it was like um, someone trying to, they're trying very desperately to understand what happens and like figure out what that loss means to them. And blending that with mystery, I think it's just very natural as well because uh, often like, I don't know, we've just been like through two hellish years, I guess <laughs> now. And I feel like some of us are still investigating and still trying to understand like the losses we felt and how everything like went down. So it's a constant investigation. So it's not exactly, um, I wouldn't say it's fast paced as in the way the thrillers usually are, but there's a lot of like investigation and a lot of looking into the reasons behind why people do things. And obviously it is a fantasy because I wanted to take, like I wanted to do four fairy tale retellings at once. And like these four girls are both like they're kind of reincarnated fairy tale heroines in a way. And so it was very like trying to balance out those elements with off magic with the mystery as well. And I think I think fairy tales can be also very mysterious in a way, because, you know, if you go back to the original green tales and all, they're not. They're not very Disney princess like, hey, happy ending, people singing. There's like a lot of blood in it. And there's just like a lot of people killing each other. <laughs> and uh, that was always interesting to me. Like even as a child, I just like it. I just really love the darker stuff. So that's that's immediately what I went to. And I was like, what if all the fairy tales have bad endings? Like what happens if we never get to the happy one? Like how do you break that? How do you like overcome that in the story? And that's the inspiration behind it. So I think it was for me, especially like with this book, it was just very natural because like the deaths were happening and there was this investigation. So, and we're blending in, um, like even my publisher suggested it. They were like, oh, we shouldn't just market this as a fantasy. We should like market it as well as like a fantasy thriller. So we can just both pick up like the audiences for both genres. That makes total sense. I love the cover, by the way. I was looking at the cover. Thank you. It is gorgeous. Like the team did so great with it. I love it so much. It's a beautiful color. Kit, what do you think? Um, I When I was writing Blackout, I mean, it, it started with the idea of a character first. So the, the, the kind of seed that everything came from was this idea about a girl who lived in a cellar and was just furious with everything and, and everyone. And um, I kind of, I guess, drew on a lot of sort of ideas from from real life and from history, you know, so, so the kind of real North South divide that exists within in Britain and um, the history of the Berlin Wall and this idea about, you know, what happens, you know, when fossil fuels run out um, and, and kind of all of those things sort of it came into kind of building the world. Um, and as well as, I mean, I'm a mental health professional in my sort of day job. And what that meant was that, I think, you know, I had, had all these characters in really traumatic situations. And what that meant was that I then spent a lot of time thinking about uh, their mental health and how the situation they were in impacting on them and so the books became a lot about kind of mental health as well um 
So um, I didn't really think too much about what genres it was going into when I just kind of had this idea of a story and then, you know, it just went from there. Um, it was interesting to kind of see how it how it sort of ended up, I suppose. I guess the thriller side of it came from, you know, this sort of character who was really angry and was really kind of, you know, pushing change and recognising that things weren't, weren't right in the world and had this real sense of injustice and this real sort of drive to um, kind of fight back against that. Um, so, um, yeah. It... So I think um, one thing that I've discovered, so in my Seven Sins series, you know, it, it is dystopian, but there's this fantasy element of it that comes in um, and I don't wanna say what it is cause it's spoilery, but um, I know for me that it proved a little bit challenging when I went to go ahead and work with my publisher to market the book because I could see all the ways that as, you know, this sort of dystopian post-apocalyptic post piece, it would appeal to sci-fi readers. But um, there was also this very strong element of romance that ran through it. Um, and then because of this other piece that comes in towards the end of the first book and is definitely present in the second and third books, um, that that's a fantasy piece. So it's this blend. And um, I know as people have responded to it, some people have really responded well to the fantasy elements, some to the romance, um, others to uh, the dystopian piece. So I'm just wondering for all of you, have you found that it's been an advantage? I know Angelina talked a little bit about, you know, well, I feel like I need to connect with each community on its own um, and that's been helpful. Um, do you feel like having more than one genre in your book has been an advantage in terms of reaching out to readers or do you feel that at any point there's been any confusion about it? How do you, how do you feel about that sort of reader connection piece with multiple genres in the same book? Oh, I guess I have to call on you again, Kit. What do you think? I think? I think there's a lot of opportunities with it, but I think it also comes with a lot of challenges too. Um, I think, like you say, it's kind of sometimes it's hard to know which element to focus on in terms of where you're pitching it, and particularly if you're pitching on social media, something like Twitter, and you have to be very succinct, and you're like, well, which bit do I talk about? And you know, who am I sort of targeting this this towards? Um, I definitely think it makes for like you know richer storytelling, you know, and kind of you know really complex and um interesting stories but it can be really hard to be uh maybe it's just me um and and my my issue with brevity but I mean, it can be really hard to kind of be succinct i think and to know um which elements to kind of i suppose to play on when you're when you're marketing it and how, how to connect with with yeah with with the right readers i don't know how other people have found it yeah i would tend to agree angelina what do you think um, yeah, I totally agree with what Kit said and how it's like finding those readers um, that's really just the name of the game. So that's why I love connecting to an existing sort of like story or movie because then people instantly go, oh, I know what that is. I can connect to it. I already love it. I'll probably like your book too. Great. I'll read it. So, I mean, not that it's always that easy, but, you know, in a hypothetical world, I mean, it's, it's just good to kind of latch on to things that are established and loved already. Um, and then from there, people will either form an opinion or form a new opinion, and then you can just kind of go about it the best you can. So, Tende, what do you think? Do you feel like people have looked at your book um, th sort of predominantly through the lens of the ghost paranormal piece and then the rest has kind of fallen into place? Or how, how do you feel like people have, have come to it? Yeah, it's, it, it's been a bit of a weird one for me. I, I, I think a lot of people have, have got it. Uh, but certain readers come in with sort of like a preconception of, of what the book ought to be. And when it deviates from their expectations, they're often very, very sort of like uh, disappointed. Not to self, do not read reviews, right, on Amazon. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why should it be? I, I think Laura, just listening to, to, to your d depiction of the book, um, I'm sure someone will come in and say, yeah, but why isn't it just a traditional fairy tale, you know, or, or, or stuff like that? And it's like, well, it, it wasn't intended to, to be that. But I think most readers are pretty smart and, and, and gregarious and, and they're willing to try new things that, that differ a bit from, from what they're used to. And, and so overwhelmingly, the, the response has been pretty, pretty positive, which is heartwarming. Yeah. It's fabulous. 
Laura, what, what, what do you think? I think there was a certain challenge, but at the same time, I feel like readers like to be challenged. I don't think like we should just, I mean, the stories that often fall into just like one genre or just one plot are not that interesting. Like they have been done a hundred million times. So if you're like, it falls just flat, that is my opinion. <laughs> but uh, I think that there is an interesting, like, as Tendim said about the blend of fairy tales, like we've seen a lot of fairy tale retellings that are just like strictly fantasy. So why not blend in other genres as well? Like people will be just, oh yes, I have read like this fairy tale. Um, for example, like Snow White retellings, I can just like say like five or six at the top of my mind that are just like straight up way fantasy retellings of Snow White. And even though they may be different, they're all like in the same genre, they fall into the same conventionals. And this can be interesting, but it can also be like, oh yes, another Snow White retelling of YA fantasy, like, oh, again. And when you blend in more genres, it can just, uh, you give a new twist to the story. And at the same time, like, I feel like readers like to be challenged and they like to find interesting new things. But I think the biggest challenge itself from like, marketing your book in that sense is that it comes from the industry itself like because um the industry with publishing and like book selling they just we have the categories and it's just easier to place them in like one side of the shelf or on another for obviously it's just easier for readers to find what they like but at the same time it is very limiting especially with marketing and i don't think it's necessarily like a problem with readers like oh readers won't like this blend it's more like are we uh, actually marketing to people who will like both things? Like, are we challenging them or are we just like telling them, oh, this is fantasy, this is thriller, just do whatever and don't mix them up. And I think it is certainly like more of a challenge for like publishers. And if you're a self-published author, that complicates things exactly because uh, you have to kind of like follow the same rules as publishers have before and that kind of tricks you. But at the same time, that is to your advantage if you're self-publishing because you can just like do something different than publishers are doing and reach a new audience that publishers themselves aren't like reaching out at right now, um, the way they're organizing things. I would completely agree. And I think that's such a great point to make. Um, I, so with my first couple of books, I was with Ballantyne, you know, which is part of Penguin Random House. And then with my YA series, I'm with this small, wonderful press called Blue Crow. And it's a completely different experience. And even though Blue Crow is a small traditional press, because it is small, I do have more flexibility and more ability to pivot. Of course, there's pros and cons to being both with a large traditional press and with a small one. Um, but it is very interesting to me to just have sort of been on both sides of it because it was brand new to me to be in this small publishing world after being um, in this larger traditional world. And there is some stuff that gets carried over, but there is this wonderful flexibility where when you're with a small press or if you're indie publishing yourself, where you can see what readers respond to and you can tweak your message and you can really adjust and move so that instead of looking at these categories and saying, okay, well, readers know to expect this, this, and this, you can see what works so that you can mix up your fairy tale and your mystery and, and you can mix up your ghost and your thriller. So I, I think that is very, very true. And it's so interesting to be a part of an industry that creates expectations. And I think what everybody said about giving readers the credit to discover and challenge themselves is so, so, so important. So I agree. Um, Kit, I wanna ask you this next question and then um, extend it to everybody else as well. Um, just because you spoke about working in mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so of course, as we all know, we've been through this pandemic, we're going through this pandemic, blah, blah, pandemic. Um, and so for those of us, for those of us who, you know, tend to write stuff that can have darker themes in it, or for those of us who, you know, are writing stuff that's dystopian or apocalyptic, um, whether we were writing this before the pandemic happened or whether we started writing this stuff throughout or whether we were writing our stuff before and it happened to be published during the pandemic. Um, I know that 
you know, for me, this has proved a little bit challenging psychologically because when I set out to write my dystopian piece, you know, I'm in the U.S. It was the run up to the election in 2016. I was very distressed as to how this was looking. I was afraid it would turn out in point of fact how it did turn out. Um, and so writing my dystopian series with fantasy kind of blended in was my creative way of kind of coping with that and imagining, well, what would happen if this did actually come to pass? And then what if I could fold this amazing fantasy piece in and make something wonderful and different out of it? You know, so that, that was my perspective. Um, and then in the middle of all this, the first book came out in the middle of last year, smack in the middle of the pandemic. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, you know, I, Myself, I'm drawn to reading some things that are lighter right now. Some things, you know, I'm binge watching Outer Banks on Netflix and just stuff that's going to kind of lift me up a little bit. Um, but I also see the value of reimagining in these sort of dystopian societies, finding hope within that, finding something positive, finding a way to reimagine and look beyond. Um, so I would just love for each of us, and maybe starting with Kit because of that mental health perspective, just talk about what it's like to um, write and publish stuff that is either out and out dystopian in some of our cases, or if not dystopian, darker um, in these times, and how how all of that how, how all of that feels to you um, as a writer and a reader. Yeah, so I feel like I went through this like really weird journey with writing Blackout and, and Sparks because I started writing Blackout quite a long time ago when the world was a totally different place. You know, Brexit was not a word. You know, if someone had told you that, uh, told me that Trump was going to be in power in 2016, I probably would have laughed in your face. And then, you know, a few years later, the, the world was really different and a lot scarier and a lot closer to, you know, the, the, the worlds of my novels, not saying that I accidentally predicted the future, but it, you know, it all felt quite unsettling. And that meant that the process of writing Sparks felt really different for me. Um, like it felt a lot more serious in some ways because it felt like the world we were sort of inhabiting was a, a lot closer to, to it. Um, in some ways it was kind of cathartic, I think. I think writing Sparks was a real sort of exercise in sort of exploring things like intolerance of uncertainty and what you do with those feelings of fear and, and frustration. Um, and then it was, then I released it in, in July last year in the middle of a pandemic. And I think, as, as you say, Emily, it was definitely a really odd feeling releasing a book like that in the middle of, you know, such a kind of catastrophic time. Um, you know, I had a lot of, um, you know, questions about, you know, is anyone actually going to want to read it? Like, is it the right time to be releasing this book? Um, I was actually really touched by the reception it got and, and people who read it seemed to really respond to it. And, and like you say, to kind of find some um, some hopefulness in it and 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 some, you know, I guess some, some power in, in that idea of, you know, you know, finding agency, kind of standing up for what you believe in. Um, so was, that was really moving, actually, um, to, to kind of get that feedback from from readers. Um, I definitely think there's a kind of uh, an element of kind of needing to sort of check in with yourself, look after yourself, uh, you know, when when you're writing about and sort of exploring dark, dark themes and uh, um, and I sort of check in with yourself about whether whether that's okay for you and, and what you need to do to take care of yourself at those times. And um, really interestingly, actually, I know you, you said, Emily, that you were kind of drawn towards sort of lighter things. And, and I found that I went in a completely different direction with my writing. I ended up writing a fantasy romantic comedy um, in the last six months of last year, um, which is not something I've ever written before. But and it was such a joy. It was such like an escape from um you know what was going on in in the world at, at the time um so yeah it, it, it was curious i think I, I really felt like personally i really needed that at, at that time um but i think there's there's definitely benefits to be able to use to being able to use fiction to sort of to explore um serious things that are going on in in, in the world and our sort of responses to that and figuring yeah like figuring out who we, we want to be how we, the kind of world we want to live in um, how to make that world a, a reality. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And I love that you went and, and kind of wrote a rom-com, a fantasy rom-com. <laughs> I'm not alone. All genre blending. <laughs> yes, I'm not alone. Um, Tende, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I totally think what, what, what Kit says is, is almost like um, 
and I won't word it as well, but just using the fiction as a way of exploring what's going on in the world. I will confess that though, because like I'm, I'm Zimbabwean, I have a much higher tolerance for what could go wrong. Emily, you speak of the 2016 election and, and by and large, when I look at that compared to sort of like a Zimbabwean perspective, I'm like, okay, so that was a bit of a rough time, but the system generally kind of held and mm -hmm. things sort of or are getting back on track so th that's why i said earlier that the depiction that i have of 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 edinburgh in in my book is sort of like a, a third world city so there's been this um there's sort of like a movement of african um sci-fi writers and one of the things they've been talking about is is the fact that you know for these guys a lot of the dystopias they see sort of like re they read about in western works aren't exactly as dystopian to them. It's kind of like, okay, things don't work. There's a bit of a political crisis here and there, but this is, you know, it, it's not as bad. So for me, the weird thing was during the pandemic, I, I did a lot of running. I had good opportunities to explore the city. There wasn't any traffic. There weren't any people about. So because my work is set in Edinburgh, I was able to sort of like venture out into these other parts of, of the city I would normally avoid. And I was working on on book two in the in the series. And while I recognize, you know, this big dreadful thing was going on, I, I consciously made the decision to use it as an opportunity to um to you know to do my work because I didn't have friends coming over, I didn't have events to go to, I didn't have anything else going on except being in my space and and doing my work. And in a way it, it was like an opportunity where I, I got a lot of work done. And so I kind of stand here sometimes thinking about sort of like events here and thinking, yeah, they're, they're, they're bad, but trust me, things could be a hell of a lot worse. So I'm in that position where I'm grateful. I, I do use the fiction uh, similar to both you, Emily and, and, and Kit, as, as a way of kind of just exploring the world that we live in, what it could be, and, and at least in fiction, whatever you do however wacky and 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 out there it is it's still a safe environment to to kind of experiment and and, and that's why i love it yeah well it's so interesting that you say that because you know throughout um the pandemic i do have friends in other countries where there's been some extreme political unrest and we've talked about that and you know um I, um, during the pandemic, I was driving home from somewhere, I think a doctor's appointment, and I was listening to BBC World News. And I, I was, you know, just got in the car, kind of turned on National Public Radio, which is our public radio network here, in the middle of a show. I didn't really know what they were talking about. And they were describing all of this unrest and unrest in the streets and all of these different things. Um, and as I was listening, I was like, oh, I wonder where they're talking about. And it very quickly became clear to me that they were talking about the United States. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, this is a, a it, it's, it's a very interesting thing to find yourself um, in a country that is temporarily destabilizing in that way. And um, speaking to my friends who are living all around the world who had so much more experience with that than I did really helped me, as you're saying, Tanda, to put it into context and say, you know, this could be so much worse. This is things, you know, these are things that happen. These are things that countries have come out of, um, et cetera. So I really appreciate what you're saying um, from that perspective. And we've got um, someone right now weighing into the chat saying, um, Tunde, that they love your contributions because having authors that are outside the framework of the United States and the UK brings so much to the table. I think it really does. Um, and I think that that's especially true when we're talking about writing these dystopian stories. So on that same note, being outside that framework, um, Laura, what do you think? What do you think about all this? I kind of like relate to every single word and they said, <laughs> yeah, living in Brazil right now, it's, it's an experience for sure. Um, I've kind of like always lived here. I learned um, English when I went to Australia to live for one year with my parents in an exchange like program. And then I came back and I always lived in Brazil and it was very really different. It has always been very different writing for because in a way I am writing for the US audience. It is always like I have to set that framework when I am actually working because um, that's what I chose to do when I started writing in English. 
and and as well that there is a difference like when we're talking about like the system that works inside the us um versus what's outside it and you know while us is just like yes this is bad this is terrible and at the same time like they're still interfering with like all our countries and like latin america and africa and like basically like third world they're just like doing the stuff they've always done so um that definitely complicates things and it definitely puts it into perspective as Tendi said that we just like um this could always be so much worse and i mean it kind of like sets you free in a way you know in a different sort of way it's very free it's like yeah this could be worse but you know we're living through it and um for for Grimmer's Girls, it wasn't uh, such, because it was very different from my previous work, like last day. Ah, that's horrible to point out. Anyway, last, oh, that, that works much as little. The last day in for seven were, are very like dystopian. It is about like a girl who survives the alien apocalypse and she is all alone for like six months. And one of the things that I definitely wanted to explore was like depression and um, post-traumatic stress disorder and all those things that survivors, like what does it mean to survive in a world that is going to change completely once you actually get through it. And I think in that sense, I'm very glad I started working like they're just like published. Uh, the first seven was published in March. So it was very, like a very beginning of the pandemic. So I could just like in a way, um, kind of like not work on those during the pandemic. And I understand if readers don't want to pick up this kind of story. I think it's hopeful in a way because um, the way that you learn to survive this kind of things like really, really helps. Like there is a way of surviving. You will eventually get through it. And I think that's a very hopeful message. And we're starting slowly, very, very, very slowly to start coming out of this pandemic. I mean, United States kind of thinks that it's already out because most people are vaccinated, but um, like I haven't been vaccinated yet in Brazil and most of the Brazilian population still hasn't been vaccinated. So I'm still pretty much stuck at home until um, everyone around me gets vaccinated. And I feel like there are many countries still both in Latin America and Africa as well that will take some time before we get things back to normal. But I think there is a sort of hope that we definitely can get back to normal eventually. And I think that um, I've always been a very hopeful writer. I've never, like, I like the dark stuff, but like there's some gore as well in Grim Rose Girls that my editor was like, oh, do we really want to put this in? I was just like, yes, let's do it. Blood, <laughs> come on. <laughs> and I was very excited for this, but at the same time, like um, the all the message that I wanted to bring into my writing is always about being hopeful and coming through in the end. So even while writing that like dark stuff, you go through a dark period and you come out on top. I love that. I just want to make sure I can't see Angelina anymore. I think maybe her signal dropped. Can any of you see her? Is it just me? No. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if she was like in the waiting room. Yeah. She, um, I'm She's emailed to say that she there's a storm and she's lost power, so she's oh. she can't get back in at the minute. So in in the Where United States, there is a hurricane, um, and it's traveling up the East Coast. I had it yesterday, so this is probably what happened. Okay, I just didn't. You know how these things are funky sometimes. I didn't want to leave her out if she was there. Um, so I wasn't going to ask this, um, but I am going to ask this because I think so many of you touched on this, and I want to know more about it. Um, and what I'm wondering is. Um, and we talked about this a little bit, but I think, you know, so in my, in my other life, when I, you know, years ago, um, before I was writing, I worked for an arts program and the art was an arts program for youth in need. And what we found is all of these kids who had been through so much, if you went to them and you talked to them very directly, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? They'd kind of roll their eyes like, okay, I'm sick and tired of people talking to me about how I feel. But if you had a drumming class, if you had a painting class, if you had a dance class, if you had a pottery class, all of a sudden you would see these kids come to life, these shut down kids just 
drumming and like maybe you could see the rage and how you know their hands hit the skin of the drums or you'd see like the release and cathartic happiness and how they moved across the dance floor and so you know i think about this when it comes to writing you know um how it's not only a way for us to walk and step into new worlds as readers but as those of us who are writing speculative fiction and laura and Tende, you touched on this a little bit um what is it that is so special about writing, whether it's a ghost story, whether it's a fairy tale retelling, um, whether it's a fantasy, whether it's dystopian, what is it about this that, um, or does it for you, allow you to maybe work through real world issues, um, even if you don't realize that you've done that until you finish, sometimes that happens to me, I don't do it on purpose, I'm just writing my story and then I get to the end and I'm like, oh, that's what that was about. Um, but do you find that when you're writing any kind of speculative um, fiction, be it fantasy, be it mystery, be it fairy tale retelling, be it paranormal, that you use that to work through any real world issues? And and if you do, how do, how has that manifested um, in your work? I know it's a big one. <laughs> Tende, do you want to try it? Well, yeah. That that's a very very sort of like interesting question and 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 if i'm to be a bit mis mystical about it it's, it's almost like how we have dreams right and scientists know dreams do something they they, they help us process the world or, or something like that but we don't quite know how they do it um that would be the mystical answer but for me i mean when i'm working through things and 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 like you rightly pointed out some of the stuff you only notice afterwards that you know you've worked certain things in that you've been thinking of um at the moment you know um if if if, if anyone's read my book or is going to read it you will notice that the protagonist lives in a slum outside of edinburgh which generally i mean edinburgh hasn't had slums since sort of like the victorian days um but i think i'm working through kind of this state of anxiety that that anyone living in the west well, a lot of people living in the West feels that the economy is a little bit more precarious than it used to be. I mean, certainly for young people coming up today, there are far fewer opportunities than sort of like the post-war generation and that kind of thing. And I've begun to realize those are some of the issues that I'm, I'm working towards. But again, I always work it through sort of like um, the perspective of I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. I left when I was 20. Uh, so I've almost done, you know, I've almost lived here in, in Scotland as, as much time as I have in, in, in Zimbabwe. And one of the things I start noticing over time is kind of these similarities in, in, in terms of how the Zimbabwean economy slid to what's happening now. So you have these, this rising inequality. You also start getting, you know, a different kind of political rhetoric that, you know, and, and I recognize a lot of the processes that, America was going through just listening to the rhetoric. I mean, even, even small things like um, power cuts, etc. cetera, they, they, they tend to, to signal that something is not quite right. And, and here I'm sort of thinking more of the, the Texas thing, which, which could have been avoided. Um, and when all those forces kind of converge together, and, and, and that's when you get pure, pure mayhem. And, and that's what I'm doing through my fiction. And, and I sincerely hope things don't get like that because I don't want to emigrate again. <laughs> and and since Brexit, we, we left the EU, like where else can you go, right, Kit? So, <laughs> but those are kind of like the things that I'm working and I'm, I'm almost working through what happened as I was as I was growing up to the state of this place that I came to and, and that at the time when I moved here, it was such a hopeful, optimistic place to be. Uh, not necessarily perfect or anything like that, but I'm looking at it now thinking, ooh, I mean, my anxiety is like right now, you, you think about all the money that's been printed over the last couple of years. And I can tell you in Zimbabwe, we used to print a lot of money and we had like the world's of like greatest hyperinflationary event. And at the moment I feel it whenever I go to the shops and I buy things and, and it's almost like, hang on a minute, my pounds aren't stretching as far as they used to. So it's those things that are gradually working their way in, in, into my fiction. But that can be, you know, it can also be cathartic. Um, 
just to be able to do that, especially when you have this whole other situation that's largely outside of your control. Kit, you're also in the UK. I'd love to hear from you because these things are happening here. Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting to hear your perspective on it. You know, for uh, having come from from a you know from a from a different country, you know, in a, an entirely sort of different sort of situation, and like you say, kind of coming to this country that we, you know sort of symbolised kind of hope, and then seeing it, seeing things kind of deteriorate. That that's a really interesting perspective. I mean, I I grew up here, and um, it. It's definitely, I mean, I'm conscious that, you know, as, as bad as things, you know, can, can be here sometimes, you know, we're, we're in an immense position of privilege compared to a lot of other places in the world. And it's really important that we we not forget that, that we are really fortunate. And, and at the same time, I think um, definitely it, it's frightening to kind of see the world changing and not, not for the better. Um, you know, I suppose from my perspective as a healthcare worker, for example, you know, I, I qualified sort of 12 years ago. I've seen the, you know, the NHS and uh, the demand on services, the demand on mental health services and the, you know, the, the available resources change a huge amount and the impact that that has on the, the client groups I've worked with. And um, I think what that says about kind of, you know, the what's happening in kind of wider society, the, the pressures that people are under and are going to continue to be under and, you know, the help that's available to them or, or, or not. Um, so yeah, I really identify with what, what you're saying. Um, but I think that writing, like you say, can be a really cathartic thing. I think there's something about kind of being, to be able to process something and move on from it, we have to be able to kind of tell ourselves the story, don't don't we, I think. Um, and, you know, whether that's kind of directly or sort of, you know, indirectly through through our writing or through reading somebody, you know, somebody else's story. Um, I, I definitely, I don't think I work kind of certainly not intentionally don't don't work kind of things from my own life directly into my stories but I definitely I think like others of you have said like sort of look back afterwards and be like oh that's what that was about you know I wrote this at a time in my life when you know I was processing this particular thing and somehow that's kind of worked its way in um I think also it kind of you know doing it through fiction or reading about it in fiction it gives us a kind of safe space to to engage with those things doesn't it it's just a little bit removed it's still human it's still about humans and human emotions but it's just a, a little bit removed from our own reality to be able to kind of engage with it in a way that feels a bit safer a little bit less uh, a little bit less raw i suppose i think there can be huge power in that yeah, I definitely agree about fiction being a safe space in that way, for sure. And Tende, I think you mentioned that before, too. Laura, what do you think? Oh, I totally agree with this. And I think um, especially speculative fiction does allow you to kind of like bend the rules um, a lot for like whatever you're trying to process on. So I'm usually very intentional with my writing and the themes that I want to explore. And often there are, in fact, like things that I have been going through, like with the last eight and the first seven, like the main character has like a lot of suicide ideation, which was something I went through as a teenager. And for me, it was important to write the story <clears throat> about like the perspective of a girl who is also going through it, but kind of like survives in in a way that allows her to explore the world in a different way and for rumor of girls it's it's a bit of the same like um in a way i kind of like started the story about like i don't know it was such a different way like i i started writing it in like 2014 and then i like put it in the drawer and never thought about it again until my editor asked uh what i was going to submit next to them and I kind of like brought it out and I was like, oh, here you go. This is a story of like this four fairy tale reimagined um, princesses that like are dealing with a lot of things going wrong in their lives. And um, it was also like the story of um, like how many, how important it is to also have like a support system for what we're going through. Like uh, I think in a way the pandemic has isolated a lot of us from our support systems being like family, friends, and at the same time, like brought us 
together in a way. Like, I, I don't know, like I talk to my friends every single day, like all the time. We've like made a work group that like none of us work together. We just like made a group chat for just complaining about work. And that's like all we do all day. <laughs> but it was very important to us. Like uh, it is very important to have like um, a sort of support system for going through tough times. So, and I think that was important, like, to put it in my writing as well. And I completely, like, lost myself in the question now. But I think that the idea behind speculative fiction is that you can definitely explore themes that feel heavy right now or that you're still working through. And what Tanda said about, like, oh, you see the world, like, and you see the mirror of something that you have already seen in the past. Like, how is that going to work? Like, how, how will we move forward with this? And in a way, I think I'm very like Brazilian about this because Brazil is just like everything is on fire and we're still like making jokes. And I'm not sure if that is like 100% healthy, but in a way it's like, it's, it's all that we've done um, like to get through as a nation. And I think that is also like important in a way that you can see the bright side or that you like you know everything is ending but you still find something that is worth like saving or laughing about and i think that's something that is going on with my work as well like no matter how dark it gets it still has like a lot of jokes it still has a lot of memes it still has like a very hopeful tone in the end perfect so we have about i guess nine ten minutes left so um, I want to shift a little bit to just speaking um, to any emerging um, or new writers or um, writers who are maybe shifting genre, experienced writers who are watching this who are shifting genre. Um, what, what advice do you think that you would give um, to either emerging writers or experienced writers who are interested in um, writing work that blends genre um, or stepping out of their comfort zone for the types of books that they've previously written. I know several of you have said, well, I, I wrote this before, whether it was more lit fic before, and now it's, you know, more Library of the Dead with this ghost element, whether it was more dystopian before, and now it's this fairy tale retelling. Um, and Kit talked about a little bit of a shift. I know I did as well. Um, so what advice would you give to folks who are either interested in blending genres in their writing or moving from a genre in which they'd previously written into a new one. Yeah, Laura. I'll go first. <laughs> and I think the idea is that like how, what I always try to do, like give advice to writers is that write what you want and write what you like. And it is important. I know like we're always talking about marketing in the end and like what's going to become of our books and we have to like walk a tight balance usually between like what you want to write or like what makes sense next for your career but i think often like sometimes like when you're drafting um when you're drafting when you're writing a new story you shouldn't have to worry about like what's going to look like so far ahead in the line that's going to change because you can change the project like Oh, your your editor says like I'll do more thriller here or do like do more romance and that's fine like you can change later but I think um for the toughest part is always like finishing a draft and finishing like a story getting through and I think that you should experiment as much as you want and like um Nothing new has been ever done in, in this planet. I mean, like, <laughs> we're, a, we're like a society that has been living through, like, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 years of stories already. So you're not creating anything new. And at the same time, I think that the idea of you're not creating anything new was very freeing as well, because you can just, like, do whatever you want. And because if you're not creating anything new and you're just like experimenting and trying new stories that like, how do they blend together? How can you make that? And you can tell a very unique story even without having to like the pressure of creating something that is mind blowing and no one has ever seen before because that won't happen. But just like have fun with it. Um, that is the most important thing I think for me, just like have fun, write what you want, just do the most fun thing that you can think of with your own writing. Perfect. Um, Tande, what do you think? 
I, I agree with you 100%, uh, Laura, there about sort of like just going out there and, and doing what you want. Uh, I'm going to attack this from a slightly different angle, which is writers who were working sort of like in another area moving into a genre. And, and what I would say is be respectful of the genre. And I'm speaking of this really popular, I think it was last year or the year before last popular literary writer who decided to write this um, sci-fi novel about AIs falling in love. And he had stuff to say, oh yeah, but this is this is serious stuff. This is this isn't rocket, you know, this isn't like rocket boots or things or anti-gravity boots and really kind of just dissed the genre. But when you listen to what he had to say about his book, that stuff had been done in sci-fi to death. There was nothing new, original, insightful that he had to offer at all. Um and, and so for me, my own personal experience was actually working in short fiction, and there's a lot of really good markets for genre sff that one can work in and you can hone your craft and and don't ever just think this stuff is is easy um it, it is pretty you know when you actually engage with practitioners in a particular genre and, and see what they're doing i think it's an enriching experience um at some point i would love to move to out and out crime and i've been working in short fiction again and and kind of just meeting people working in the genre, but I wouldn't just leap into it until I have that skill set where I think, okay, I'm ready to be able to do this. And and I think this is the, the mistake a lot of authors do. They, they kind of just jump into it and think, oh, well, you know, I've been doing literary fiction and, and, and it's up there and, and, and genre is easy. And when no one actually engages with what they do, they, they, they then end up being surprised, but that's because it's no good because there's a lot of really awesome work that's that's happening in, in these different genres and you really have to know what they're about yeah i agree uh, completely and uh you know i saw the same thing there was someone who did a very similar thing with writing romance where they're like oh well this is just going to be so easy and i'm just gonna you know whip this out and i think the romance genre in particular which is not what we're talking about here but you know is something that gets a lot of disrespect yet it has some of the largest readership and some of the most supportive communities in the world and it's also really challenging to write and write well and, and there were very specific conventions around that and so i could not agree more that there is disrespect that gets paid towards genre fiction, but yet genre fiction readers are some of the most amazing, loyal readers that you will ever get in the world. And um, so I, I, yes, I completely agree. Know your genre. Um, Kit, do you want to say um, what you think for about a minute? And then we just have a few minutes left, so then we'll just go around and kind of wrap up. Yeah, so, I mean, I completely agree with everything um, you all have said, I think really wise words there. I guess there's a couple of things I'd say about genre blending. Um, I think the first thing I would say is, you know, if you're gonna do it, do it with purpose, you know, do it because it's what you what your book needs and it's, it's about the story that you wanna write. Um, I, I think, yeah, really think about the story that you want to tell um, and, and believe in that. And if that means you're pulling in elements of different genres, then go for it. I think, you know, be aware it might be uh, more difficult to market. So if you know, if you are wanting to pursue publishing, you know, self-publishing or traditional, then that is something to think about. Um, I think, you know, it, with regards to genre conventions, you probably do need to think about that. You know, it, I think, Emily, at the beginning, you mentioned about kind of appealing to readers of both genres. So you probably need some uh, thinking about whether your book is going to appeal to readers of both genres or, or neither. Um, and to do that, as Tendo says, you need to understand the genres that, that you're writing in. Um, and, and how they work. So yeah, I think that, that would be my advice. Absolutely, and um, I do think that um, uh, thank you. Sophia is in here saying lovely things that she's really excited to read everyone's books and um, people have been saying that they're learning a lot and that is so wonderful because I'm also learning a lot and just have just been thrilled to have this opportunity to um, listen to everyone. Um, so we just have about two minutes left. So let's just go around really quickly and um, just say where people can find you online. And, and what we'll try to do afterwards is um, when um, this comes up um, for ThrillerCon later, um, we'll have everybody's contact information in the description. But um, for now, um, Kit, where can everyone find you? So you can find me on Twitter, um, either by searching Kit Mallory or I'm at Kit Cattis. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Kit Mallory Writes. Um, you can find my books in paperback or Kindle on Amazon. 
Perfect. Tenze, where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter under my full name, uh, Tendai Huchu, uh, at Tendai Huchu, T-E-N-D-A-I, or on Instagram, same handle. And you can find my books on, on Amazon or, you know, you can just order from your local bookstore, which is even better. Yeah. Yes. Um, Laura, how about you? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Laura M. Paul, P O H L, or uh, in Instagram at only by Laura, and and that's pretty much it. You can order my books, and pretty much I think wherever books are sold, your preferable store, and you can pre-order Green Rose Girls, which comes out in November second. Fabulous, and you can find me on my website, um, emilycollin.com, or um, on Instagram at. Emily underscore Colin. I'm sometimes on Twitter, not much at Emily A. Colin. All right. Well, look, one second to go. We did it. We did it with perfect timing. We are rock stars. Yay. Thank you, everyone. That was thank great. So yes. Thank you thank to you everyone, everyone for joining us. I had a wonderful time. I hope you all did too. And um, thanks so much for everyone who came and attended and had such fabulous things to say. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.